it's just really important to be sure that a growing country has enough homes, that we have homes but, but for young Canadians, that we have homes for new Canadians. Respectfully, that Mr. is about fairness, and that's what we're doing. Wasn't that your government's job over the last eight years? When you say for generations, governments have been under-investing, isn't that, doesn't that make your, your own government culpable? Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. Christia Freeland has been making her rounds on mainstream media, trying to gaslight and bobblehead her way into convincing anybody that her 2024 budget is actually a good thing for Canadians. The problem for the Liberals is that nobody believes her. Let's take a look. First question to you is based on the response you offered to Pierre Polyev's statement in the House of Commons. Why is the fight you want with the Conservatives about taxing the rich? My focus is not on the Conservatives. My focus is on Canadians. And our budget today was about meeting the moment for Canadians. It was about fairness. It was about saying Canadians have real needs right now. They need more homes built faster. They need life to be more affordable. They need us to invest in the economic capacity of the country. They need us especially to do it for fairness for younger Canadians who are struggling to get ahead. And they need us to do it in a fiscally responsible way. That is the plan that we put forward today. And it's gonna be up to the Conservatives to say whether they support it or not. But the focus that you drew in your response was very much, for example, on the new tax, the new the, the, the changes to capital gains tax. And I'm wondering, did you need to even introduce those changes if you had acknowledged that the, the housing crisis was what it was at an earlier juncture? Would you need to be spending so much on increasing the supply if you had realized perhaps earlier that you could have deflated demand to better impact prices and not raise taxes in any way? I Stop the, talking logic. <laughs> I don't Stop know the that. that. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Stop that. Um, yeah, th this is the magical question, right? You know, in 2015, they ran on the election saying, oh, well, we're going to fix housing, quote unquote, fix housing. That was half as expensive as it was today. And they didn't do anything. And then, you know, when, when, when COVID was doing what COVID was doing and the housing prices shot up, what did the liberals decide to do? Hey, let's bring in half a million people every year. Let's do that because that'll fix housing. Like they didn't they didn't pay attention to it at all. It's only when Pierre started <laughs> actually doing his road trip and gaining in the numbers that they actually said, "Well, I guess we should worry about this now." Like they didn't care when they were up in the polls. They only cared when they were down in the polls. Surprise, surprise. Well, and remember they had made suggestions that conservatives were racist for suggesting just having the audacity to suggest that high immigration numbers are not good in a housing crisis well and that's why the conservatives were able to like bob and weave like mike tyson though those implications they completely stayed away from it because they knew this was going to come and bite them in the ass eventually and it did and now it's the liberals that are the ones saying well you know we need to look at immigration but only the temporary residents you know, we can bring in all the permanent ones, uh, but, you know, it's, it's the temporary ones that are the problem. And when we're saying it's the temporary residents, because that, we're, we're saying that's the province's fault. That's not our fault, despite the fact that we actually run immigration. Canada is a growing country, and I think that is a great thing. I think as a country, we have been under investing in housing for a generation. So I am, really, really glad, I am really, really glad ago. that our government is investing massively in housing, is investing massively in the infrastructure to support housing. And I am glad to see provinces and municipalities and also the private sector and not-for-profits really getting involved. I think it's great that Canada is growing. It's just really important to be sure that a growing country has enough homes, that we have homes but, but for young Canadians, respectfully, that we have homes for new Canadians. Respectfully, that Mr. is about fairness, and that's what we're doing. Wasn't that your government's job over the last, last eight years? When you say for generations governments have been under-investing, isn't that, doesn't that make your, your own government culpable? <laughs> you know, another thing I love about Vashi is that when 
it doesn't matter who it is. It could be a liberal, it could be a conservative, it doesn't matter. She will talk over them if they're giving a BS answer. Well, and that's why Freeland tried to keep talking because she's like, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> something's coming. And uh, and it came because Vashi's like, Vashi was like, incredulous in her response. She's like, really? You seriously are suggesting that? Like, okay, so we haven't invested in a generation. All right, fine. But you're you've been a here third. for the last nine years of that generation. You're, you're, so. you're over a third of that generation and you've done nothing. Our government has been focused on housing and focused on infrastructure since we first formed government. Really? I seem to recall JT saying something different this past summer. Yeah, I remember that. And I'll be blunt as well. Housing isn't a primary federal responsibility. Yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. I remember him getting that uh, shiner on his forehead too and uh, him announcing his divorce uh, a few days later. <laughs> this is where the narrative, it completely, it completely bites them in the ass because, okay, so either you were not focused on housing for the last nine years and you're deciding to do something about it now, or you are focused on it since the beginning and you've done a terrible job at it because housing prices have doubled. Oh, but according to the liberals, you know, they've been focused on it the whole time and things are getting better. You know, it's, it's their standard MO. The challenge is more acute now. It's more acute in Canada and it is more acute around the world. And we're stepping up and we're recognizing that. I, I think the really important thing to take away from this budget is we recognize that this is a pivotal moment for young Canadians. It's a pivotal moment for millennials. It's a pivotal moment for Gen Z. In our pre-budget tour going across the country, I've heard from so many people, young Canadians themselves, but as much their parents and grandparents saying, I want my kid and my kid's friends to be able to afford their own home. I think we all believe that. And we know it takes an activist government, which is investing and crucially, it takes a government that's prepared to lead the charge and change but the were, mindset of the country, cut why, through the red tape, get municipalities to sure. accept gentle zoning. That is all happening. I'm very, very optimistic. Right, but why weren't you prepared and willing to do that in 2021, for example, when the average price of a home was already 97% higher than 2015? Were you talking to people in Toronto, in the age group that you're referencing, two years ago who thought they could afford a home there, or in Vancouver who thought they could afford, afford a home then? Why didn't you try and meet the moment then to av avoid having to spend as much as you are now to try and meet the moment now? Well, 2021, of course, was still peak COVID. So, the well, it economic, kept going up in 2022. No, but so yeah, but you, you, re you referred to 2021. That <laughs> I love it. Okay, so what about 2022? Well, no, no, no. You 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 said 2021. Yeah, I, I love this. We're peak COVID. Um, whose decision was that? Like, and 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 2021, builders were back to building at that point. So, how how about this? How about 2019? How about that? Well, peak COVID, quote unquote, peak COVID, the government was too busy wasting $60 million on an app that we didn't want or need. Well, they were also busy spending 360 extra billion dollars on a budget, uh, which was essentially a trial in UBI. So, you know, take, take from that what you will. But the issue is, is she's saying we've been focused on this the whole time. Where were you in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and 2019? Where were you? Where were you in 2021, 2022, 2023? Oh, I know. Somehow it's the conservatives' fault. It was peak COVID. There were a lot of distortions through that period. And some of those economic distortions are part of the reason that housing is such a challenge. I think the important thing is to be meeting the moment now. The important thing is to be doing everything we can, to pulling every lever, to pressing every button to get more homes built. That is what our government is doing. Our government is also really focused on affordability for all Canadians. And our government is focused on investing on productivity and growth of the economy. And the way we're gonna do it 
is pursuing fairness for all Canadians, especially young Canadians. That's the plan we presented today. I think that's what Canadians want to need. Yeah, um, we're, we're focusing on affordability. That's why we're spending another $40 billion in deficit, uh, you know, printing money. So that's going to be fighting against inflation coming down. So that's one, you know, it already ticked up again, but there's, you know, they're saying, oh, no, 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 it's still within the limits. Uh-huh. Okay. And when it does, you know, if it does tick up again above three, guess what they're going to say? Oh, well, you know, there's global factors, but, you know, if it comes down, it's all of them. But if it goes up, it's global factors. Well, what is it? Well, and I find it very interesting that Freeland used the word fairness again, as we had in our discussion with David Lees the other night, um, he had pointed out that over 50 times in the budget, they had used the word fairness. Yep. I smell, I smell an election platform. Well, but this is an election budget, right? This is, so for, for, for those of you, you know, um, tuning in, you've heard us talk about this before and you've no doubt heard the media talk about this before as an election budget. What is an election budget? An election budget is your is a budget where you're trying to butter up the, the the public. You're trying to say, look at all of these things. And then you go into election and you say, well, if you don't vote us in, you may not get all these things that we put in our budget. So you better elect us. Yeah, the conservatives will slash, slash, slash is what they're going to say. But that word fairness, it feels to me like, again, they're trying to divide Canadians by saying, oh, you know, the rich people, they don't pay their fair share. The corporations, they don't pay their fair share. It's not fair. It's not fair. Vote for us and we'll bring in fairness. Well, and the funny thing is, is like Trudeau keeps saying, well, you know, Pierre is the one that's dividing Canadians. Hello, you're literally doing it with this budget. Your whole budget from everything that you've said is you're focused on millennials. You're focused on the young people. Screw the old people, right? Screw the old people. We're focused on the young people because the young people have left us in droves for the conservatives because they know they will never be able to afford a home because of us. And we keep spending even though we shouldn't. All the economists are saying, what are you doing? Liberals are saying, what are you doing? Nobody has any idea what they're doing. So the only explanation is this is a last ditch effort to get people on their side for an election. That's it. Why are you so focused, solely focused, I should say, on the supply side? And I'll bring it back to the issue of demand. Because the uh, portion or the number rather of temporary residents in this country has doubled as of January over the last two years. Again, not something that happened overnight, happened over the past few years. Your government has just now decided to address the temporary stream of immigration. Is there any consideration to looking to the permanent stream temporarily while the housing crisis is as acute as it is? Or is the plan solely to spend more to attempt to drive the supply of housing? Why not tackle demand in a more meaningful way? Oh, I think that's a really good question. And I do think it's important for us to be sure that housing supply and the number of people in Canada match up. And that's why the work that Mark Miller has been doing over the past few months is so important. Let's remember change in visa requirements for Mexicans, a cap on international students, a huge source of temporary residents, and a cap on the number of temporary residents. I think that there is more work to do when it comes to temporary residents, particularly when it comes to temporary foreign workers. So I absolutely so agree will that. Be, is it fair I to say your government will do more on that, that side? I absolutely agree that that is important. I do not want to say more broadly, I believe in a growing Canada. I think that that is a strength of our country, that we're able to grow our population. That is a huge strength of ours when it comes to the demographic challenge so many countries are facing. We need to be sure that our housing supply and our population match up. And I think the fact that, that, your that, didn't is what our, that is what our government is absolutely focused on doing. That is what Canadians want and need. Do you feel, I guess, some responsibility that your government didn't ensure that was the case over the past few years, therefore somewhat casting doubt on the value of immigration as you espouse it and as so many Canadians have believed? We show polls. You can see polls. of.
view of immigration has wavered, has changed from the steadfast way in which Canadians believed it did contribute to the economy and the fabric of our country over the years. And that is mostly due to the fact that they believe the immigration that your government presided over has negatively impacted their ability to afford a home. Bingo. And that's exactly it. Like, people aren't against immigration because of the good value that they bring to Canada. People are against immigration right now. Doesn't matter where they're from because the country can't support it. Full stop. I know I'm not the only one, but I get so irritated when Christian Freeman said, well, Canadians don't speak for me. Do not speak for me when you say Canadians anything because it's probably incorrect. Well, and something I found interesting is uh, she had alluded that we needed immigration um, because of the economic impacts and, and, and whatnot. Um, but the liberals have made it so expensive to have children in this country. Why are Canadians not having children to replace our own numbers? Right. And here, the, the, the two biggest reasons is A, it's too expensive. And B, both mom and dad have to have a full time job. Both mom and dad have to have more than a full-time job these days. Right. So who's going to take care of the kids? And you can't afford to take maternity leave or paternity leave. So where does that leave you? So why are we not focused on creating an economy that is family-focused? Yeah, child-friendly. Right. Now, CTV wasn't the only network that uh, Chris Freeland went on. And uh, she ended up going on Global News and just watch the body language of the host here because she cannot believe what Christia Freeland is actually saying here. With me now is the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Christia Freeland. Let's start with the increase in capital gains tax. I believe you were saying it will affect 0.1% of Canadians, the very wealthy. Can you explain exactly who will pay more, who you're targeting? Is it going to include, for example, someone's elderly aunt who is thinking of selling the family cottage? Um, well, let me start with who is excluded because that is the vast majority of Canadians. More than 99% of Canadians will not pay as individuals a higher rate of capital gains and I just want to be sure people understand that. So the most important thing, the, most, the biggest asset most Canadians own is their home. Our homes are all fully excluded from capital gains taxation that continues to be the case do you see how she didn't actually answer the question that was asked she kind of skirted around it and answered the question she wanted to answer oh for sure for sure and um but it does concern me because the fact that she says oh don't worry we haven't applied it to to home uh you know primary residence transactions that tells me they've thought about it that's what that tells me. And if if they stay in government, which I have no no belief that they will, but if they did, I, I would not put it past them to then include that. Yeah, so you got to move for work and, and you've got to downgrade your you gotta home. you got to sell your home for any reason. Yeah, that's it. You're done. Capital gains. Yep. Bang. So all that capital that you had invested in your home is gone, gone to the government who's just going to waste it and squander it. Yeah, it would not surprise me. So here's another reason not to vote liberal in the next election. The second thing which we are bringing in is a new tier. And this tier means that the first $250,000 of a capital gain in every single year that a Canadian might enjoy is taxed at the current rate of a 50% inclusion. So you actually only pay any tax at all on 50% of it. And it's because of that really narrow focus, which is entirely intentional, that this additional tax is really focused on those at the very top, on people who can afford to pay a little bit more to make the investments that our country really needs, that especially young Canadians really need. So I'm not exactly clear on who that is then, and, and you know that the business community is already saying that by doing this it's sending the wrong message for a country that has a big problem with productivity. Yeah, I mean, what I think is important for Canadians to know is we are very focused on productivity 
productivity on economic growth. And what the Ministry of Finance looks at is the marginal effective tax rate. It has, you know, a really good engine for calculating what that is. That's like the extra tax that you pay for each additional dollar that gets invested in a business in Canada. Today, Canada has, by a long shot, the lowest marginal effective tax rate in the G7, and we have the lowest marginal effective tax rate, lower than the OECD average, with this new capital gains inclusion rate announced today. That doesn't change. So I am really focused on ensuring that Canada remains a really attractive place for people to invest. And one of the things we've done in this budget is make more investments in Canada's economic capacity. So the thing that you have to pay attention to, I will say the Liberals, when they're talking about really anything financial, is that they use extremely specific terms, like marginal tax rate, debt to GDP ratio. They talk about their triple credit rating. And they talk about these things because they are so specific and it's smoke and mirrors to make it seem like everything's great. So here's the thing. Um, when you're talking about Canada and taxes, Canada is actually one of the highest tax countries in the world. We are 25th out of 172 countries in terms of the highest tax countries in the world. And that's personal tax rate. We're also one of the highest countries in the world when it comes to corporate tax rates. So when Freeland says, oh, com country or companies are lining up to invest in Canada, not really. Why? Because we have one of the highest corporate tax rates. Well, and listen to this tidbit of information that I found. This comes from a report from the OECD. Uh, it's a 2023 tax report. Uh, and it compares various different countries. I'll put a link in the description as always. Uh, it says, in Canada, the average single worker faced a net average tax rate of 25.6% in 2022, compared with the OECD average of 24.6%. In other words, in Canada, the take-home pay of an average single worker after tax and benefits was 74.4% of their gross wage, compared to the OECD average of 75.4%. So it doesn't sound like we're lower than the OECD average the way that Freeland is claiming. No, because she uses extremely specific metrics. Well, she cherry picks her data. The, un the other extremely uh, specific metric that she uses is debt to GDP ra ratio, right? Well, this, this, <laughs> this is a huge huge sm uh, smoke and mirrors term that she uses all the time and now she has anita anand saying it and everybody else well what does that really mean lowest debt to gdp re ratio in the oecd Sh or in the g7 that's what she says sure that's right but you can't use that as a metric so we decided to take a little bit of a closer look at what our debt is and what it ranks compared to everybody else. So, here it is. So, when you're talking about debt, um, this is the gross debt as a share of GDP. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not that great because the higher the bar, the more debt uh, you have as a percent of GDP. So that's not great. So we're over like 104%. So you have the first graph, which was net debt to GDP ratio. The second graph was gross debt. This illustrates the ranking between the two. Yeah, like the difference. So and there's a big difference between Canada's net debt and our gross debt. So here's Canada. And what this is, is this actually shows that the difference in rank from net debt to gross debt is that we're last. We are last when it comes to this. 
This is coming from a report from the Fraser Institute called Caution Required When Comparing Canada's Debt to That of Other Countries. And here's a pretty concise explanation. So the reason that Freeland cherry picks this stat is because of actually the strength of our pension plan. And what she is doing is she is including the fact that we have all of this money that Canadians have been putting into the Canada Pension Plan and the Quebec Pension Plan for decades. And she's using that to offset the debt in this metric. So it says right here, one reason for this pronounced change in ranking is that net debt includes the assets of the Canada and Quebec pension plans, which have unique approaches to funding public retirement plans. Unlike most other industrialized countries, the CPP and QPP invest in non-government assets, including equities and corporate bonds. The thing is, is that money isn't the government's. That's ours. They don't just get to take that and spend that on, on, on anything. But they're trying to include that as an asset of the government. But it's not theirs, it's ours. Right. So when it comes to this, you know, debt to GDP ratio, it is a phantom. It doesn't mean anything. Like without the CPP and in, in, in QPP in there, we're last. So it, it shows that Canada's in some trouble when it comes to our debt and all of us know that like imagine if every month you were spending more on the interest of your credit card than you were on groceries you would be pretty concerned and rightfully so and we're spending more on the actual interest to the debt than we are on health care than we are on many government programs most of them, $54 billion. That's more than 10% of the budget, folks. If you're spending more than 10% of your annual budget on interest, that's a problem. Especially when you're talking about a country with a $500 billion budget. Okay, we're running out of time. I just wanted to raise one thing with you. You know, your critics say that the Liberals are good at addition, not so good at um, subtraction. Um, and that the, right now the cost of servicing the debt in Canada is $46 billion in 2023-24. That's more than I think what is spent on the Canada health transfer. Your critics say the spending measures on top of that are reckless. What do you say to them? Well, I say actually that is economically illiterate and completely ignoring the international comparatives. Your critics are economically illiterate. Right. So let's let's talk about some of these critics. Um, previous Liberal Finance Minister John Manually, previous Liberal Finance Minister Bill Morneau, previous Liberal director of Bank of Canada, David Dodge. And you have more and more economists coming out saying, what are you doing? Hello? Okay, so you're trying to say that it's they're financially illiterate, says the lady who ha has no training in, in finance before becoming finance minister. Just putting that out there. Um, and... <laughs> The fact that we spent $46 billion last year, we're slated to spend $40, $54 billion this year. That's $100 billion, folks, in two years servicing the debt. And it's financially illiterate to say adding more money on top of that, adding to the debt, is not a good idea. Oh, well, don't you understand this capital gains tax that's quote-unquote only going to affect one percent of the population that's going to bring in what was it 19 billion dollars they were estimating allegedly allegedly it's not going to be that no and the truth is it's not going to only affect one percent of the population it's going to affect a lot of canadians right but the good news is, is she's the one that is actually going around trying to sell this and she doesn't know how and everyone is calling her out on this everybody so the more she talks, frankly, the more people are going to be aware that this budget is an unmitigated disaster and it just wakes up more and more Canadians who only watch mainstream media 
as to how incompetent this finance minister and her liberal government actually is.